One draft pundit believes the Bucks should trade up in the first round, but not for the position you'd think. That and more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome into this Wednesday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or view every single day. Don't forget you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can follow along on Twitter. I am James Yarko at JYarko underscore Bucks, credential member of the media covering your Tampa Bay Buccaneers as deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com. Here with you every Monday through Friday, along with the everydayers. And for that, I want to share my appreciation for your continued support of the show. One of the ways you can support the show, become a Locked On Bucks insider. You're going to get news, rumors, updates, general thoughts, plus one-on-one conversations with me via text message. Go to jointsubtext.com slash Locked On Bucks to become an insider today. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Visit fanduel.com slash Locked On to get started. A former Buccaneer says that the Bucs might just be better off without one of their starters from last year. And an NFL.com mock draft takes a look at what every team should do rather than what they will do. But we're going to start things off with Bill Barnwell of ESPN talking about what which teams should move up, should move down, or just stay put in the first round of the draft. Barnwell put together a piece on ESPN going pick by pick through the first round, deciding whether a team should make a trade to move up, make a trade to move down, stay at the position that they're in. And when it comes to the Buccaneers, Barnwell believes that they should trade up. And he says, quote, the Bucs are another team in the cornerback market after trading Carlton Davis to the Lions. And while they could stay put and still land help at that position, they'll have to contend with the Packers, Eagles, and Dolphins, all of whom should be thinking corner. The Chiefs at number 32 might also be in a position to try to trade up with the Cowboys or Packers to grab a replacement for Legereus Sneed, which could prod Tampa Bay to get more aggressive in moving up, end quote. Now, I talked on yesterday's episode about one or two players that Jason Light has his eye on to trade up and get after he had mentioned that there were some guys that they felt were worthy of that kind of aggressive move. But I'm going to be honest. If if there's one thing I am I am with all of you, all the viewers, all the listeners, I'm as honest and transparent as I possibly can be. If the Bucks move up in the first round of the draft, I do not think it should be for a corner. I know on yesterday's show, I mentioned Quinion Mitchell and I mentioned Kool Aid McKinstry. But if the Bucs are making an aggressive move to give up draft capital, either in this year, maybe in the future, maybe both, to jump up on night one, it should be for an instant impact guy. And by that, I mean an edge rusher or an offensive lineman. Potentially wide receiver, if that's the route they decide to go, I can see the argument for that. I can understand the argument for that. But to me, it's edge rusher or offensive line if you're going to be that aggressive in the first round. To me, a rookie corner is not an instant impact guy. He's going to be a mid to late season and a year two and beyond impact guy. We have seen it since Todd Bowles came to Tampa. Corners in their first year, in his scheme, in his system, have growing pains, and they struggle. It happened with Carlton Davis and Jamel Dean. It happened with Zion McCollum. It happened with Sean Murphy Bunting. It's the way bowl system is. Once they get it and it clicks, they're they're off to the races, and they're fine. But that's not an immediate thing. That's an after-the-offseason work, after training camp, after preseason, 
then into the regular season when they're learning from their mistakes and trying to get a grasp on all the intricacies and all of the responsibilities that Todd Bowles puts on the shoulders of his secondary. Now, could Zion McCollum and Jamel Dean and Antoine Winfield Jr. help with a rookie corner and try to bring him up to speed faster? Absolutely. But if you are sacrificing draft capital to go get a guy, I think it needs to be someone that helps the team the moment they walk into the building. It needs to be a player that solidifies a weak position and elevates those around him. Interior offensive line, edge rush, arguably wide receiver, running back, those are all weaker position groups to me than cornerback is right now. I still think the Bucs need to add a corner, and I think that they could add one in the first three rounds, but they can address it without giving up one of those top 100 picks that they have over the course of the first two days and without sacrificing future draft capital. I'm all for trading up. I am perfectly fine with it. If Jason Light wants to be aggressive and move up, which has not been his MO in round one, he has moved up one time in the first round since he became GM. Most of the time we see him trading down. He's trading down maybe somewhere between like two and six picks and getting more day two capital, which is really where Jason Light makes his money and, and finds some of the best contributors we have seen on this Buccaneers team over the course of the last 10 years. But if he wants to be aggressive and he wants to, you know, give up some picks to move up and get a guy, I'm all about it. I just don't think I like the idea of trading up for a corner. I don't see that guy in this draft. I like Cooper DeGene. I know some of you in the chat aren't, aren't big fans of him. I, I've seen you guys talk about that before for those watching live on YouTube. I like Kool-Aid McKinstry a lot. I like Quinion Mitchell. I don't. I don't think any of these guys are a sauce gardener where it's worth the amount you're going to have to pay to move up into the mid to late teens to ensure that you get one of those guys. Cause as Barnwell talked about, you got to get ahead of the dolphins. You got to get ahead of, of some of these other teams. Um, the, the Packers, the Eagles, the dolphins, you know, the dolphins are at pick, I believe 21, 22 right in there. So you're going to have to jump ahead of them. You're probably looking at, you know, 18, 19, 20 as the range that you're going to have to get into. That's moving up six to eight spots, and it's going to cost you a lot. I talked about what the Bucs would have to give up in order to move up to 20, which was kind of the, the ceiling that I had placed on a, on a trade up. That's going to cost you one of your third rounds at least, plus additional capital, whether that's an additional pick or it's a pick swap, or it's a future draft pick, but it's going to cost you at least pick 89 or 92 to jump up to 20 plus even more. I just, I don't see that guy at the cornerback position in this draft. I really don't. I think there's a lot of really good and really talented corners. I don't think there's anyone out there that I would say, you know what, it's worth giving up you know, a, a wide receiver or an offensive lineman or, you know, one of these other positions that they can get in the third round just to go get a Cooper DeGene or a Kool-Aid McKinstry. And Kool-Aid McKinstry very well could drop to the Buccaneers at 26. I just, I just don't see it. Uh, Going to jump into the chat real quick. Uh, James Tolson, that's kind of a, a relatively new name, or at least, you know, one I haven't seen in the chat too crazy often. Maybe Early morning is a better time than than early afternoon, or late morning is better than early afternoon for you. But James says, agree for me, it's only edge to move up for. Wide receiver is loaded, and this season, he would only be a number three at best, and honestly, may not get more targets than White or Otten. Interior offensive line, I wouldn't because of second round success. And that's a really good point. Uh, Jason Light has found some really good uh, day two and, and especially round two offensive linemen. I mean, as much as people like to bag on Donovan Smith, the Bucks had a starting left tackle in the Super Bowl that came on day two of the NFL draft. And then, of course, Ali Marpet has been fantastic. You, you have Cody Malk, you have Luke Gedeke. Those are later picks. I feel like if you can if you can move up, maybe not you know into the late teens, but if you can move up, 
three spots, four spots to ensure that you get a Graham Barton, I'm all about doing that because I think Graham Barton really changes the way this offensive line uh, works together and, and is able to not only protect Baker, but open up those running lanes. He's a guy that I would move up for. Uh, San Anto Gato says Powers Johnson. There's a lot of people that are starting to sour a little bit on, on Jackson Powers Johnson and saying that the media and fans value him more than NFL scouts and NFL coaches do. It'll be interesting to see how he falls in the NFL draft, but this could be one of those guys that we talk about being a first round prospect that falls into day two because NFL teams don't like him as much as NFL fans or, um, you know, NFL media. But Ian Beckles, a former Buccaneer, thinks that the Bucs are better off at corner now than they were before. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. The Boston Celtics are the favorites to win the NBA Finals at plus 160, while the defending champion Denver Nuggets are plus 350. If you're looking at those always exciting Stanley Cup playoffs, the Florida Panthers and Carolina Hurricanes are tied as the favorites at plus 700 each, while the Dallas Stars are the favorites out of the West at plus 800, and the Tampa Bay Lightning are 12th at plus 2,400. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs and slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Thank you again for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. Every day, make sure you are coming back tomorrow. I saw it in the chat. Richard says, Winfield Jr. and the Bucks working on a deal. I will have more to say about that coming up on tomorrow's episode. Adam Shine reporting that the Bucks and Winfield are working on a deal that could land Winfield as the number one paid safety in the NFL. I will dive into that on tomorrow's episode. In the meantime, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and you have to turn down the volume from all that shouting? Then just make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On a recent episode of his podcast, Ian Beckles laid out his feelings on the Carlton Davis trade that sent the former second round pick to Detroit in exchange for a third round pick. And he said, quote, Carlton Davis wasn't good last year. Carlton Davis was on the bad end of a lot of very big offensive plays. Were they better with Carlton Davis? I'm not sure because there were times last year when Carlton Davis was out and the Buccaneers played better defensively. They did. I saw it, end quote. Uh, real quick, there is something that I want to address in the chat. Richard, again, says cornerback is good in the first if there is no high-rated edge rushers available. And Richard, I bring up that message because, number one, I didn't want to lose it. Number two, I'm going to talk about that coming up in just a minute. But according to Pro Football Focus, Ian Beckles is not wrong. Carlton Davis is coming off of his worst season since his rookie year in terms of performance and he was a huge liability in multiple games including the loss to the Buffalo Bills the loss to the Houston Texans in that unbelievable implosion defensively and then the loss to the NFC champion San Francisco 49ers last year Davis allowed the highest completion percentage of his career when targeted, 63.3%, the most yards per reception in his career, 14 and a half, 
the second most yards after catch in the third most touchdowns of his career. It was also the second highest quarterback rating allowed when targeted of his career. And he was called for six penalties. That was not a good year for Carlton Davis. His defensive grade and coverage grade from Pro Football Focus. And again, it's not the end all be all. It is a tool that I like to utilize because it helps put things in some kind of perspective. But his defensive grade and his coverage grade were both the worst that they have been since his rookie season. And it's not hard to see why. Davis just wasn't good. The fact that the Bucs got a third rounder out of him was absolutely fantastic value. And you all know that I've been big on Zion McCollum since last season because he was more effective when he was in there. He wasn't the same level of liability that Carlton Davis had become. And quite frankly, McCollum and Izian were probably the two most reliable corners on the team last year. And the Bucs are putting a lot of eggs in the Jamel Dean is going to bounce back basket. If he doesn't, it could be a really long year for the Bucs. And all of this boils down to my previous point. The Bucs still need to address corner in the draft. This position group is not set in stone, but I'm interested to see not only how they address it, but how they use the players that they already brought in. Tavier Thomas is slated to be a slot corner. That doesn't mean that Christian Izian is, is going to lose out to him, but that's where he is projected to be. Bryce Hall is looking to return to form and might relish any slip up by Jamel Dean so that he can get himself back on the field in a bigger role and a as a bigger contributor. The Bucs have already taken strides to try to fix the position. We just haven't talked about it a ton because, let's be honest, talking about the Bucs drafting Cooper DeGene or Kool-Aid McKinstry is a lot more exciting than talking about Tavier Thomas or Bryce Hall. That's not fair to Hall or Thomas, if if I can be frank. They could very well be impact guys this season, but the difficulties of that scheme that I talked about earlier also pertains to Hall and Thomas. How quickly will they get it? How quickly will they understand their responsibilities in Todd Bowles' defense and not be the liability that Carlton Davis was last year or Jamel Dean was last year? We could very well see the Bucs get off to a slow start this season, struggle defensively with the changes in the secondary before we end up seeing a spike around the middle of the year where things start to gel and the defense really starts to click. That said, I know a lot of people were disappointed in the trade of Carlton Davis, but I agree with Ian Beckles. The Bucks' defense is probably better off and the team is probably better off as a whole depending on how they use that third round pick that they got for him. And one last point that I would like to make here before I jump over to the chat before our last break, this whole situation might have Jamel Dean's spidey senses on, on high alert. His former partner in crime, his former teammate, both collegiately and in the NFL, got a big contract, didn't live up to the contract, and got shown the door. Jamel Dean is now in the same boat. He got a big contract. He did not live up to it last year. And he has one more chance to step up and show that he deserves that contract or he's going to be shown the door too. And I don't think it's crazy to think that if, if Jamel Dean's contract structure was different, he would have been the one that was traded away instead of Carlton Davis. Not saying that, you know, Carlton Davis is better than Jamel Dean. I I think last year they were pretty much similar guys. But Jamel Dean has to ball out this year if he does not want to suffer the same fate as Carlton Davis because the Bucs have an out after this season and they will absolutely move on from Jamel Dean if he plays the way he did last year. Going to jump in the chat one more time real quick. Uh, We got got Sean in the chat says, I'm going to enjoy this draft. Wait for all the fireworks. It's it's going to be a good one. The draft is always exciting because we have all of these preconceived notions going in, 
that never end up panning out. And then everybody kind of goes nuts on social media. I think it's hilarious. I think it's a lot of fun, but I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, Divis Druid says, let light work his magic round two for an interior offensive lineman. I think that that's probably the route that they're going to go. But again, I think Graham Barton is... He is the guy that if you have the chance to take him in round one, you do just because of all the things that he does for the offensive line. Now, maybe there is a day two guy that they view just as good, if not better than Graham Barton, who's not getting a lot of attention. And that's what they're focused on. So they can get an edge or a wide receiver or a corner or somebody else in round one. Um, James in the chat says, uh, wouldn't be shocked if we are in a situation like White and Britt at corner with Dean and uh, Hall, who has starting experience as well. I absolutely agree. Jamel Dean has to be on high alert because his starting job can be taken away at a moment's notice if he is not performing. But there was an interesting mock draft about what every team should do in the upcoming NFL draft that is next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. Wrapping things up here on a Wednesday edition of the Locked on Bucks podcast and Adam Rank of NFL.com put together a mock draft based on what he believes every team should do in the first round, not what they will do. So this isn't a predictive mock draft it is aligning players with what adam rank believes teams need to address and then addressing it in the best way possible so of course we have quarterbacks galore in the top 10 right wrong his mock goes off the rails almost immediately he has two quarterbacks going with the first two picks then we don't see the next quarterback taken until pick 11 so a lot of these projected top 10 uh, teams looking for a quarterback, Adam Rank does not put those quarterbacks in the top 10. So we have players flying off the board much earlier than we see in some of these predictive mock drafts. But for the Bucks, Adam Rank has them taking Chop Robinson from Penn State saying, quote, I was about to say wide receiver Xavier Worthy should be the pick here, but upon further thought, Trey Palmer showed enough in his rookie season to continue playing the burner role. And with Shaq Barrett gone, you need to find somebody who can rush the quarterback. I'd be happy if you landed Robinson in this spot, end quote. Now, to Rank's credit, uh, Dallas Turner, uh, Jared Verse, Leatu Latu, all gone. So was Jackson Powers Johnson. So was Graham Barton. Now, Jerzon Newton was still there, and he went the next pick after the Buccaneers. Adam Rank could have made that argument. He mentioned Xavier Worthy from Texas, which would have been a fun addition. But with the way this board fell, I think this was probably the right choice. I don't think that I'm taking Worthy or Enos Rakestraw or Nate Wiggins over Chop Robinson. Again, I can make the argument that Jerzon Newton, the defensive lineman out of Illinois in that spot, makes as much, if not more, sense than Chop Robinson does. But either way, you're doing something to address the pass rush. And this all brings me to my, my words of caution here. Most of these mock drafts have the Bucs going edge rusher in the first round. I have talked a lot about the Bucs going edge rusher in the first round. All the experts, the pundits, the know-it-alls have talked about the Bucs needing an edge rusher and probably needing to take one in the first round. That means they're not going to do it. They will literally take any other position just to throw everybody off. Now, I, I say that slightly joking uh, because over the course of the last 10 years, more often than not, the player that we see mocked to the Bucs most often is the one that they end up taking. You go back to, you know, OJ Howard. You go back to, I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, I think Vita Vea was another one that was mocked to the Bucks a lot in that pre-draft process. Um, Kalijah Cansey was a guy that, that I and some others 
had mocked to the Buccaneers pretty consistently in the process. It seems like everything kind of sets up where Jason Light is pretty transparent when it comes to the first round. But this is something that I have said and will continue to say as the draft gets closer. Do not fall in love with one specific position group and do not fall in love with one specific prospect. You have to look at all the different areas of needs and potential fits for those position groups and not get tunnel vision. If you're tunnel vision and say, if the Bucks don't get Barton or the Bucks don't get Verse or Jackson Powers Johnson or whoever, then, you know, then the draft was a, an absolute failure and, and Jason Light should be fired and, and he sucks and blah, 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 blah. If, if you hyper-focus on one of those guys and say it's this guy or it's a wasted draft, you're going to end up disappointed and angry on draft night because the odds of them getting that one specific person are slim and they may not have any control over it. Your, your top three favorite draft prospects could be gone five picks before the Buccaneers even get a chance to be on the board. So keep an open mind and remember my other words of wisdom and, and approach to draft picks. It's about the collective, not the individual. Do not overreact to night one because they took a wide receiver or a corner and you wanted them to take an edge rusher or an offensive lineman. Just wait and see what day two brings. Then wait and see what day three brings. It's about the collective of all seven rounds of the NFL draft and who the Bucks got to help out position groups of need. It is not about one singular in a vacuum selection. So don't freak out. Don't go, you know, acting like a Dallas Cowboy fan and punching your TV and breaking it. Just wait it out and see how Jason Light and Todd Bowles work their magic and figure out what guys they can bring in to help the three-time defending NFC South champions and help this team get to the playoffs once again. Going to jump into the chat one more time before we get out of here. Richard says, seriously, Chop looks like JTS 2.0. I'm going to vehemently disagree with that take. Um, I think Chop Robinson is much, much better than Joe Tryon Choyinka. And I like Joe Tryon Choyinka, so don't hear what I'm not saying. But Chop Robinson is a much more talented, pure edge rusher than Joe Tryon Choyinka is. And again, if your opinion is that he's he's going to be JTS 2.0, I respect that. We're going to find out you know, here in about eight months. But no matter what team he goes to, we're going to see what he can do on an NFL field. So maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, James in the chat says, unfortunately, I feel better about Xavier worthy than chop. I want to love chop, but where's the football ability to go with his freak athletic ability. I would say first off, Penn state was not a good program last year. Uh, but I would say getting someone with chops, freakish athletic ability and the raw football talent getting him in Tampa along with Todd Bowles and George Edwards. And then you have Randy Gregory there who can, you know, try to help bring him along a little bit. And I realize Randy Gregory has had his, his issues in the past, but they brought him in for veteran leadership and to help these young guys. Uh, I would say that that's going to play a role into it. I would rather swing and miss on a, freakish athlete with you know raw football talent then play it safe and end up you know that guy biting you in the butt down the line and i get it chop robinson is a he's a polarizing prospect he's not he's not refined the way leatu latu or or dallas turner are but you can see the the pieces there that todd bowles and george edwards are going to want to mold and try to form into a a an edge presence to compliment Yaya Diaby. Um, Divis Drew had said Light will get a phone call from a team about to take Latu, and they will ask what you got. Light will get the deal done. 
and Latu will be in red and pewter calling it now. I hope you're right. I hope you're right because as much as I do like Chop Robinson, uh, Leatu Latu is my favorite prospect for the Buccaneers in the first round. I'm not going to be, you know, furious if he's not the selection, but if he's there, I feel like the Bucs absolutely have to take him uh, just because he will have that big of an impact. And again, if I'm if I'm power ranking my edge rushers for the Buccaneers that I think they have a chance at getting, uh, as slim as the chance may be, Leatu Latu is my number one. Jared Verse is my number two. Chop Robinson is my number three. So I like him, but I feel that there are other people available. And even if Chop is sitting there at 26, there may be other players that I like better for the Buccaneers. And then you could potentially snag Jonah Ellis out of Utah in round two who can come in. Now there's not as much pressure as being a number one pick, but you still have that freakish athletic ability. You still have that raw football talent. You have a lump of clay, essentially, that you can mold in to a very, very talented edge rusher in the NFL. Uh, one last one. James in the chat says, agree on Latu. He's my number one. I had the Bucks trading up to 20 in my recent mock this morning. With that, I'm going to bid you all a fair adieu because I am out of time. Coming up tomorrow, I'm going to talk more about the rumblings of the Bucks and Antoine Winfield Jr. working on a long-term deal. You had Josh Allen, I think it was Josh Allen, this morning with the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars going from the franchise tag to a mega deal. There's only two guys left that were franchise tagged that do not have a long-term deal worked out and are still technically on the franchise tag. That's Antoine Winfield Jr., T. Higgins. I think Winfield is done sooner than later. So maybe by the time tomorrow's episode rolls around, the deal will already be done. But I'll talk about that coming up tomorrow. In the meantime, make sure you are subscribed on the YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcast. Follow on Twitter at LockedOnBucks, at JayArco underscore Bucks. Become an insider at JoinSubtext.com slash locked. On Bucks. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. I want to thank you so much for joining me right here on Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 